All right, well, we will get started. So welcome everyone again to the Permafrost Science and Engineering short course hosted by PERN, uh, the Canadian Permafrost Association, International Permafrost Association, and the US Permafrost Association. Uh, we're really excited to introduce week two of the course, this time on cold regions engineering. Uh, and I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Simon Dumay, a professor at the Royal Military College of Canada. So as Dr. Dumay, I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to you. All right, thanks Alan for the introduction. Um, everything good? Yeah, I can see you and hear you perfectly. All right, so uh, before starting, I'd like to thank Piran for the invitation to uh, give this lecture or this short course. So it's the part one of cold regions engineering. Uh, and there's going to be a part two that should be more about applications. Today we're going to see more uh, basic stuff. So uh, before starting, I'll introduce myself. So I'm an assistant professor at the civil engineering uh, department at the Royal Military College of Canada. I work there with uh, an amazing group of people, researchers and students. Uh, we're building our ca uh, capacities on, on permafrost and cold region research uh, day after day. So it's, it's a great place to be at uh, right now for me. Uh, I consider myself uh, most of all a geotechnical engineer and so permafrost and cold regions issues is, is, is a part of, of what I do. I did my PhD at the Université Laval on talk consolidation in my master's also at Laval on ILB the road surfacing, so touching on embankments on permafrost. But the highlight of my student career was that I'm a former PIRN president for two years. And so I'm very happy to be here today and, and uh, be able to uh, participate in these initiatives uh, by PIRN. You see a map at the bottom left of, of my slide of, of where I, I I worked on, on permafrost issues. So you see uh, on the far left, the Inuvik to Tuktoyak to Highway and the Alaska Highway where I did some uh, research during my master's and the, where I, I work at the moment. And you see all the little villages uh, where I worked on foundation design when I was practicing as a geotechnical engineer uh, all around the Nunavik and uh, at James Bay as well. So uh, I touch on road embankments, transportation embankments, but also a foundation for us in units. I'm going to briefly introduce infrastructure and permafrost, but the main two topics of the presentation today are going to be heat transfer and soil mechanics. So we're going to talk about how the thermal state of, of the soil or the permafrost affects the, the, the soil behavior, so, so the soil mechanics. Um, I'm so glad to be able to follow uh, Dr. Ashley Rudy's uh, presentation last week. It was an amazing presentation, so I don't have to introduce all the basics of permafrost science. Uh, she did a great job with that, and to be able to build on and talk about cold regions engineering, I think it's important to uh, keep in mind all the, 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 the permafrost science behind it. So for when we talk about infrastructure, infrastructure and permafrost, we consider that any change at the surface is likely going to affect the thermal equilibrium of the permafrost. And since the thermal state of the permafrost is conditioned by heat transfer between the ground and the atmosphere, we need to get a good understanding of what are the modes of heat transfer in the ground and between the atmosphere and the infrastructure. And then it's going to allow us to talk about uh, how uh, the soil mechanics uh, are affected by uh, the thermal state, whether the soil is thawed or frozen, marginally frozen, or the transient state between uh, those of freezing soil and thawing soil. Successful design and construction and maintenance of infrastructure and permafrost rely on uh, both the thermal and me mechanical uh, stability of soils. So I, I picked this schematic from a research by uh, Vincent et al. Uh, from 2017, and I was glad to see that it was also uh, a similar figure in Ashley's presentation last week. Uh, in her presentation, it was the natural ground condition. So the buffer layer was uh, the natural ground condition. Today, we're talking about infrastructure. So what we want to 
what we want to do is to understand the heat transfer modes between the atmosphere, the buffer layer, which is the infrastructure, the active layer, and uh, the permafrost. And the heat transfer modes that we're going to talk about today are conduction, convection, radiation, and heat storage. Uh, in this short course, we're going to see uh, the basic of those heat transfer modes and some application of them, or some example of how they apply to infrastructure and permafrost. It's going to be in the second part of the cold engineering uh, course uh, that we're going to see more application and, and how it's useful for uh, the design. When we talk about infrastructure and permafrost, we we can think of many things. So uh, on the top left, you see road embankments, transportation embankments. You see housing unit at the top, either on piles or shallow foundation. Uh, you see shallow foundation for a wind turbine uh, at the bottom left. Or we can think also of dams founded on permafrost, frozen core dams, which I'm not going to talk too much about today. But the principle that I'm introducing today do apply to all of those. Uh, on the far right of the screen, you see a ground anchor or similar principle to, to a pile uh, in frozen soil. And, and that's a, another thing that we can think about when we think about infrastructure. So let's move uh, into the heat transfer mode. So the first one we're going to talk about is conduction. Conduction is due to the collision of the particles. So as, as the body gets warmer, there's more collision between the particles. And so there's a transfer of, of the internal energy uh, through this, the, those collisions between the particles. So the heat flow is from the hot part of, of, of the matter where there's more collision to the cool part, part of it. It happens in all phases of the matter, so solid, liquid, and gas but uh, it's more effective in solids and we're going to see uh, why. The thermal conductivity is uh, the most important property to consider when we're talking about conduction. So you see the equation here, uh, thermal conductivity can be termed K or lambda depending on, on the sources that you see. It's the constant of proportionality between the thermal gradient and heat flux. Basically what it means is that the higher the thermal conductivity, the more heat transfer you're going to get for the same temperature conditions. And so I've put typical uh, thermal conductivity values at the bottom here. So you see the water with values of 0.6 uh, watts per meter degree Celsius. Uh, the con con uh, thermal conductivity of ice is higher. So heat transfer is more effective in ice than in water through conduction. Then you have air, which is two orders of magnitude less. So it's, uh, there's much less heat conduction in air. The mineral salt particles you can have values around three watts per meter degree Celsius. And snow, there's a range of values here. But the main thing to show here is that the thermal conductivity of, of snow is, is a lower value. Why those values are important is because the thermal conductivity of the soil is, is depending on the mixture that constitute the soil. So the mixture is solid particles, ice, unfrozen water, and gas or air. And so uh, the, the thermal conductivity is going to be in function of, of, of the amount of each of those uh, that you're going to have in, in the soil. So it's a function of the density, the water content and the thermal state of the soil. So it's going to change uh, whether you have a frozen soil or uh, unfrozen soil, for example. So I've put the typical thermal conductivity values here at the top. So if we consider a solid particle itself, the thermal conductivity is quite high. However, in the dry soil, the, so there's no water, there's just air, the thermal conduct, the, the conduction happens through the grain themselves, and then uh, the, the, the contacts between the grain. So the thermal conductivity of a dry soil is typically not very high because uh, it depends a lot on the contacts between those grains. As the soil gets uh, has some water in it, so a moist soil, there's more uh, conduct, uh, conduction through the soil because there's some conduction through uh, the water, even though the water has a lower thermal conductivity. Mm -hmm. As you uh, increase the water content and you reach a saturated uh, soil, then you have even more uh, conduction because there is no air phase uh, anymore, uh, which has a low conductivity value. Your frozen soil is going to have a higher thermal conductivity 
simply due to the fact that the ice has a higher thermal conductivity than uh, the water. So here you see that uh, conduction uh, changes as a function of, of how much water you have, but also the thermal state. You can measure thermal conductivity either using a steady state method in the lab. So you impose a thermal gradient and you measure the heat flux, which can give you the, the thermal conductivity, or you can use the needle probe method, which measure the transient response to a heat pulse. You can do that in the field or on a lab sample. You can also uh, determine the thermal conductivity from models that exist for soils. Two of them are a uh, Kirsten model, which is an empirical model, and the Cote and Conrad model, which is a semi-empirical model. It has a larger range of applicability. If we look at the Kirsten chart uh, at the bottom here, so you have the frozen soil on the left, the, uh, the unfrozen soil on the right, and you see that the thermal conductivity uh, the y-axis here increases with water content. It, it also increases with the degree of saturation, so the easel uh, lines that you see here. And it also increases with uh, uh, the density. So as the soil is denser, there's more effective uh, uh, conduction. An example of the importance of conduction, other than the fact that it's the, the most important uh, mode of heat transfer within the, the soil mass itself, is the insulation effect of snow in winter. So if you have an infrastructure that has the, the tendency to have a snowpack around, you're going to have the creation of an insulating layer because the thermal conductivity of snow is low. And so that's going to insulate the ground and traps heat into the, the permafrost uh, during uh, winter. So when we talk about infrastructure, it's important to consider how it affects the condition around the infrastructure and uh, um, um, how, how snow uh, packs against a building or an embankment is something to consider. Moving on to convection. Convection is transfer of heat uh, due to movement of fluid. So it, it says in the definition flu in fluid, so liquid and gas, not in solid. You have two types of convection. Uh, the first one is advection or forced convection. It's due to the fluid movement from an external source. So think of wind blowing against uh, the surface of the ground or against the building or water flow. So it can be water flow at the surface or also water subsurface water flow. <clears throat> There's also a natural convection. So here the, the movement of the fluid is due to the differences in the fluid density. So as the fluid gets uh, warmer, it, it, it becomes less dense, so it rises to the surface. And then as it gets colder, it, it gets denser, and so you get the convection that's created like that. And that can occur in, in air or water. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So you can have either closed cell uh, conve natural convection or open uh, a system for natural convection. Uh, convection is uh, calculated as a function of the heat convection coefficient. So uh, without going too deeply into uh, the detail of the equation, basically it says that the, the heat transfer rate between a surface and a fluid is controlled by the temperature of the surface, the temperature of the fluid, uh, the surface area, so how much fluid touches the, the surface, and the heat convection coefficient which takes into account uh, the heat transfer uh, at the interface. Typical values of heat convection coefficient. So natural convection in air has a range of five to 50. And then force convection, obviously in air is, is more effective because you have wind uh, blowing. And so there's more heat transfer in force convection in air. And first convection in water is orders of magnitude uh, higher than that. You can notice here that there's a wide range of values for the convection, uh, the heat convection coefficient. And that's one of the issue in, in cold region engineering to be able to use uh, proper, va proper values for that. So the importance of convection uh, for infrastructure. So the easiest one to think about is the wind effects on surface temperature. In, in these cases, the heat convection coefficient can be estimated empirically relatively well. So I've put the example of wind blowing underneath a building during the summer. So it cools the surface. It, it, it's good for uh, preventing permafrost degradation. 
other than wind effects, uh, the, the convection coefficient is poorly documented. So for water flow, closed cell, open cell system, it's hard to have uh, very uh, good values that, that, that we feel confident in using in design. And I should mention that uh, as of now, there, there, there are no method available for considering convective heat transfer from water flow, uh, including surface and subsurface water flow for permafrost. So you see the embankment here, uh, that uh, CUI uh, airstrip. You see water ponding on the side. So there's permafrost degradation on the, under there because of the, the convection between the, the water and the, uh, the ground. Uh, but still, this is hard to take into account uh, precisely in, in the design. Moving on to radiation, so thermal radiation due to electromagnetic radiation. The easiest example is solar radiation. There's also some radiation from warmer bodies to uh, colder bodies. So you can think of a fire, for example, that emits uh, electromagnetic radiation, it feels uh, hot. Solar radiation is a major heat source for uh, permafrost and for infrastructure in general. It depends on the, depends on the incidence angle, so it changes as a function of whether you're in summer or, or winter. Uh, it changes uh, also the incident angle as an impact on, on the shades that you have, for example, underneath your building or on the sides of the embankment. So it's important to consider uh, where your solar radiation hits your infrastructure uh, <clears throat> into your uh, design. It also depends on the albedo of the surface. So the albedo is the ratio of reflected on incident solar radiation. Uh, the example, uh, new asphalt is 0.05. So that means that the new asphalt uh, reflects 5% of the solar radiation, uh, the incident solar radiation, and it absorbs 95% uh, of the radiation. So gravel is, is uh, lighter in color, so it's, it's 0.15, grass is 0.25, so those are just example of numbers, concrete 0.55, and snow can, can reach values of 0.85. And this is important, uh, for example, for uh, road surfacing, so you can imagine uh, using a brand new asphalt on a road on permafrost, which will uh, um, absorb a lot of solar radiation compared to a lighter surface or gravel, for example. The fourth uh, heat transfer mode we're going to talk about is heat storage. So that's split into two categories, sensible energy, so heat capacity and latent heat. Heat capacity is uh, the amount of energy you need to raise the temperature of, of a unit weight or unit volume of matter by one degree Celsius. So the amount of energy you need to warm or uh, something. Uh, the latent heat is the amount of heat that is released or absorbed by phase changes. So if you look at the schematic of an energy storage function for soil, uh, you have uh, the slope uh, of the frozen uh, soil. So at, as it gets warmer, the slope represents the volumetric heat capacity. So how much heat you need to input, so how much energy you need to input to warm the frozen ground. When it, once it reaches temperatures close to zero degrees Celsius, ice starts uh, to melt into the ground. And so you need a lot of energy uh, to, uh, for, for overpassing that latent heat uh, gap. Once your soil is unfrozen or thawed, then uh, once again, you need less energy to, to warm up uh, the soil. An example of that is if we consider one gram of ice, so to raise the temperature of, of that one speck of ice by one degree Celsius, you need 2.09 joules. But to change that one gram of ice into water, you need uh, 334 joules. So it's, it's two and a half orders of magnitude higher uh, than just to raise its temperature. Uh, to raise the temperature of water, then you'll need a little bit more energy than, than for ice. So uh, what's important to, to, uh, to see here is that the heat capacity and the latent heat of the soil uh, depends first of all of the heat capacity of the solid particles, but most of all of the amount of ice or the amount of water you have in your soil because it's that latent heat, so that phase change is only occurring in, in the, the, the water or ice uh, phase. It's not occurring in the solid particles. So the more ice you have, the more latent heat uh, you'll need, so the more energy you'll need to change the temperature. 
So it depends on the density of the soil, its degree of saturation, and its thermal state. So it's, it changes if the soil is frozen, unfrozen, or partially frozen because you have more or less uh, uh, ice or, or unfrozen water in your soil. Something to remember is that <clears throat> all those heat transfer modes that I just talked about are occurring simultaneously in most infrastructure and they change throughout the season, summer and winter. So yeah, conduction, convection at some places, radiation uh, from the, uh, the sun, for example, uh, and heat storage. So the complete heat balance for any infrastructure is, is a complex thing to be able to model and it's difficult to fully assess in an engineering design. So simplification, may be required to be able for you to, to, to do your design. But it's important to keep in mind all of those uh, heat transfer modes and how they affect infrastructure to make sure that you don't oversimplify and then you forget about things that are actually uh, important for the thermal state of your soil around your infrastructure. Um, and so now that we talked about the heat transfer mode, this allows us to determine the thermal state of the soil. So what is the temperature of the soil? And this is important because it what is affecting the soil mechanics or the soil behavior. So we're going to talk about the, the soil mechanics of frozen, marginally frozen and thawed soil, but also what happens in the transient uh, state. So in freezing and thawing. We're going to touch on, on some notions of salinity, creep, frosty, thaw settlement, thaw consolidation and thaw weakening. So uh, the mechanical behavior of the soils are di directly correlated with, uh, um, uh, with the behavior of the water and ice it contains. So um, if you look at the graph of the unfrozen water content as a function of temperature, uh, you see uh, that in the frozen state, there's little wa uh, frozen water content. It's mostly ice. Once the temperature uh, reaches temperatures close to zero degrees Celsius, then you're going to have some ice that's going to, uh, to melt. And so your unfrozen water content is going to increase. Uh, we say that the soil is in a marginally frozen state uh, at this point. And then once all of the water is, uh, is unfrozen, so you don't have ice anymore, your, your soil is thawed or it's unfrozen if it's never been frozen before. Um, and, and so the freezing occurs when it, it passes from uh, thawed or frozen to frozen, and from frozen, uh, from frozen to thawed, it's, it's thawing. Uh, the general properties of the soil, so in the frozen state, uh, it's generally high strength, uh, and it's generally uh, stable, and the volume doesn't change uh, much with application of roads. When it reaches temperature of minus four, minus two degrees Celsius, you start to increase your unfrozen water content, so the, there's a reduction of the strength, it's more uh, creep sensitive, and you start to get some uh, deformations as well. When you reach the thawing point, so here it's, it's depicted as zero degrees Celsius, but it, it can vary a little bit. You have a very low strength on thawing, and then you get a progressive recovery of, of the, that strength after some time, after some consolidation. And you notice that there's a high volume change up on thawing, that is uh, time dependent. And then uh, there's some volume change as a function of time as well after that. All thermal states uh, exist around most infrastructure on permafrost at some time during the year. So if I take a basic example of a building during the summer, you have your, your thawing or your thawed uh, active layer. Uh, some of the ground may be at temperature close to zero degrees Celsius, but below it, so you have some marginally frozen soil. Then you have frozen soil below if your permafrost is cold. In the winter, uh, it freezes back, so you have freezing frozen soil, and you can also have marginally frozen soil depending uh, on the temperature of your permafrost. A brief note on salinity. So salt in the pore water uh, affects uh, the freezing point uh, because it increases the unfrozen water content in the pores below uh, the freezing temperature. So you see the graph at the bottom here, the volumetric unfrozen water content as a function of temperature uh, for the same soil, but with the different um, concentration of uh, salinity of salt in the pore water. So as you increase the salinity in the pore water, 
at, for the same temperature, you increase your unfrozen water content. And the point where you're going to have uh, uh, little enough unfrozen water content to consider that your soil is frozen uh, is at the lower temperature as well. So, so salt has the effect of decreasing the strength and increasing the creeper propensity uh, at the same temperature. So for so you can have colder soils, but behaving like uh, warmer uh, frozen soils. Frozen soils are generally uh, considered sufficiently strong for most infrastructure projects. Uh, they are low uh, creep sensitive when you have low temperatures and, and low salt content. They can be used for ad freeze piles, ground anchors. So a good design strategy in general, if possible, make sure that you, uh, uh, you keep the soil frozen and cold around your infrastructure. Of course, this is not always possible due to the effect of, of climate warming, but also the effect and most of all, the effect of the infrastructure uh, on the thermal state of your permafrost. Marginally frozen soil are possi uh, possibly uh, not uh, resilient. So permafrost warmer than minus uh, four degrees Celsius, they should not be relied on as frozen soil. First of all, they're, uh, they're close to their thawing temperature, so uh, <clears throat> they can thaw uh, uh, quickly. And also because of the unfrozen water content, they're not as strong as frozen soils. They can be creep sensitive if they're ice rich or temperatures are near zero degrees Celsius or high salt content. Um, and special attentions, uh, attention is required for high loads. So think of embankments, uh, road embankments higher than five meters, for example. So I talked about creep, but I've not defined it so far. So creep is the long term. It's a continuous deformation of, of frozen soil or marginally frozen soil. It also occurs in unfrozen soil, but uh, that's another topic. We'll stick with frozen soils for now. So it's a continuous deformation under constant loading at specific temperatures. So think of a frozen soil that, some, that is a, a stays at the same temperature and it stays under the same loading. You're going to have some deformation uh, in it. So you have the the graph, the basic representation of creep here. So you have one graph of the strain, so the deformation as a function of time. And at the bottom is the strain rate. So the rate of the deformation uh, you get from creep as a function of time. You can divide creep in, in, two, uh, in, in three different phases. The primary phases where your deformation increases, uh, your strain rate decreases as a function of time. Then you get into the secondary uh, linear uh, uh, strain uh, rate uh, deformation. So your strain rate is constant. And so you have a linear relationship between the deformation and time. And at one point, it can reach a tertiary uh, phase where uh, strain rate increases. And then you reach a failure because you have too much deformation. There are typically three different responses for a frozen soil under some applied stress. So the first one is if it's tertiary creep dominant, then you're going to reach uh, or exceed the strength of the soil in the short term. So the load is too much or it's too creep sensitive. So you reach, you get a lot of deformation in, in a little bit of time. Secondary creep dominant is usually what we consider ice rich soils to be. So you get that first phase, but it's mostly dominant on the, the, the second phase. So uh, you have a linear relationship between strain and time. And usually we can simplify that relationship by using just a linear relationship. So we forget about the primary uh, creep. And we just consider the, the strain rate as a function, uh, the strain rate that you have, uh, depending on the time uh, that your infrastructure is designed for. Primary creep the dominant soils, such as ice pore soils, you're going to have a little bit of strain, uh, strain when you apply the load, so a little bit of deformation, but then it stabilizes and, and then you don't get excess deformation. It depends, uh, once, uh, of course, on the soil type, the ice content, the more ice you have, the more creep uh, depend, uh, sensitive it is, the stress level, the temperature, and the application length. So an example of that is uh, for, so you have a graph of the creep settlement rate as a function of applied bearing load for a shallow foundation for wind turbine. Uh, 
And you can see that the creep settlement rate, so the amount of deformation in, uh, in terms of millimeter per year you get under your footing, uh, increases uh, when you have higher uh, applied bearing load. So the more load you apply on it, the more deformation you'll get. And uh, it also changes as a function of uh, the temperature. So you need to make sure that you're in a range where the creep settlement rate is low enough so that over the lifetime of your infrastructure, you won't get uh, too much deformation depending on what your criteria for deformation is. And so that's temperature and uh, load dependent. You can have creep under uh, transportation embankments. So on, on the left, it's pretty evident the deformation that you get here. And on the right, you get a little bit of a depression where the, the, the pickup is part. And you see that this is a pretty thick embankment. So there's a lot of load on the, the, the ground. So that's what causing the creep. Now moving on to frost eve. So what happens when the ground is freezing? Um, Dr. Uh, Rudy uh, talked a little bit about uh, uh, ice lances and permafrost. So I won't go over all of that uh, today, but uh, basically frost eve is the expansion caused by the formation of ice in the freezing soil. It can be a phase change. It's a combination of a phase change. So 9% expansion of pore water to ice. Uh, and then in fine grain soils, you have the cre creation of segregated ice lenses due to the suction forces on freezing. So without going into the, all the details of the soil mechanics be behind frost eve, uh, what it creates is those discrete, uh, almost pure ice uh, lenses in your ground. And why uh, it's important, uh, by first of all, frost eve, uh, the formation of ice lenses is a function of the soil type. Uh, the applied loading. So if you have a load on your soil, it won't eave as much. And most of all, for permafrost, it's important for the fr uh, because it's dependent on the frost penetration rate. And it can also proceed without interruption for a period of years. So as you know, permafrost during its formation was subjected to freezing uh, during a long time. So the frost penetration rate at some point was very slow. So there was a lot of creation of ice lenses and it proceeded for many years. And so this is what explains those very thick ice lenses we have in permafrost. So you see the example here for the same soil, the fast frost penetration, you'll get all those little ice lenses in the, the soil. But for a slow frost penetration, you will get thicker ice lenses. So for permafrost, I've put an arrow where the first penetration rate was very, very slow and proceeded for a long time. And as I said, it, it explained the presence of some of the excess ice in permafrost. Not all excess ice, but, but some of it. Uh, I've put the definition of excess ice, even though Dr. Rudy put it uh, last, last week, but it's the volume of ice in the ground which exceeds the total pore volume that the ground would have under natural unfrozen conditions. So here I'm adding a notion of the stress level that the soil is subjected to. So the exercise doesn't only depend on the, the soil itself, but also the stress level uh, or the load that is applied on, on, the, on that soil. I'm going to expand on it when I talk about talk consolidation, but uh, in this slide, I'm presenting the next few topics. So TAW settlement, talk consolidation, TAW weakening, we're going to talk about. And, and for all of those, the towing behavior depends on the soil type, the ice content, and also the type of ground ice or the cryostructure you have. And I won't expand too much on that, but th this is interesting to consider. The rate of top penetration, so the thermal conditions, the permeability of the ground, so the permeability of the soil itself, but also of the, the ground in general, so how water is, is able to move around in, in the soil during towing and uh, stresses apply on towing. So tar settlement is the volume change on towing, so it's the result of tar consolidation. Uh, so, so when a permafrost tar, you, it may contain water in excess to the amount of, of, that the soil skeleton can hold under its current stress conditions, and uh, it's leading to tar settlement. So you see a graph here of the void ratio as a function of uh, the effective stress or the effective pressure, and you see tying occurring here and at this point here, B prime, C prime. Uh, uh, forge ratio can be thought of as a, a deformation or water content for, for those of you who are not uh, 
too familiar with void ratio. So when void ratio decreases, uh, basically it means that the water content in the soil, it decreases and you get uh, deformation with changes of void ratio. So taking uh, this graph and simplifying a little bit, so you have the void ratio of the frozen soil EF and of the thawed soil thawed under a certain uh, stress level. So the stress level here depends on how you're going to define it. There are different, different ways to define it, but uh, let's think of it as the overburden stress. So the stress that the soil is feeling it's in, in its natural condition. So on thawing, you're going to have a phase change that's going to change, cause deformation and then expulsion of the excess water uh, as a function of the stress level here. If you add a load on, on the soil, so if you put a load on the soil, you're going to have consolidation, so more expulsion of the water by consolidation. So here your soil is frozen from A to B, from B to C is thawing, and from C to D, it's a thawed soil going uh, cons uh, consolidated. Uh, I've put the definition of parameter A, A naught here. So uh, it's a function of the void ratio. So basically it's the, the deformation between the point B and point C. Uh, I've put it here to compare to uh, how it can be defined otherwise, and, and it's so, sometimes referred to as the thaw settlement. Another way to define it is a graph of the unit settlement as a function of the effective uh, stress or the effective pressure. So it's the unit, uh, so it's the settlement divided by the height of the ground initially. So what you measure is a curved line like that. Uh, it can be extrapolated and your parameter A0 here is defined like this. So it's a different definition than in the previous slide. And that's what I wanted to show here. But basically what we consider is that by extrapolating that curve, uh, what's going on in towing is that part of the curve and then consolidation is happening as you increase the effective stress. Uh, the best way to define the thaw settlement properties of your material is to do testing. So you can thaw under only one applied stress. So either the overburden stress, so sigma prime V is zero, or under the overburden stress, which is the stress in the natural ground plus the load that you intend to, to place on the, the ground. So if I come back to a couple slides, if you look at the, the graph here, so depending on so if you apply only one stress level to get your thaw settlement, you're just going to get the deformation from B to C. So you're just going to get that part of the curve. If you change the stress level on thawing, you get a different curve. So you can only thaw your sample once. And, and so you get uh, B prime to C prime, for example, at another uh, stress level. The best approach to do thaw settlement testing, in my opinion, is to do multiple loading stages. So then you obtain the full relationship between the effective stress and the void ratio. So the relationship between the thaw settlement and the load applied on it. And if you start at low stresses, then you can define a curve like this one where you have the real measured uh, behavior and then you can uh, perform your design as a function of the effective stress. You can estimate thaw settlement using empirical relationships, but you have to be very careful uh, about how they define thaw settlement. So those curves are sometimes used without looking at how exactly thaw settlement was defined. So you see here in those graphs, there's no notion of the stress level at which it was thawed. Uh, that's important to, to go uh, and look at it. So obviously the thaw settlement increases as you get more water in the frozen soil. So more water means more ice, more thaw settlement. Uh, when your frozen bulk density increases, it means that your soil is denser, so you, you have less ice in your soil, and so you have less thaw settlement. And you see that there's a wide range of thaw settlement values, even though for it's for the same bulk density and from uh, similar sites. This is because there's a variation as a function of the soil uh, types, and, and it's something as well to consider. So when you're using relationships such as that this one, just make sure that it's appropriate for the type of soil that you're, you're considering um, and the stress level that you're, you're considering as well. Um, and the best approach would be to do your own testing and compare that those, those tests, those thought consolidation 
curve that you can draw for, for your from your own test compared to empirical relationships like that. Uh, moving on to talk consolidation. Uh, so it's the time dependent compression, so resulting from the simultaneous thawing and consolidation of the soil. So there's thawing of the frozen ground and there's drainage of the pore water. Uh, in fine grained soil, or if the flow of water is impedant, so if the, the, the permeability of your ground is, is low, there's going to be generation of excess pore water pressure. It uh, depends on the ratio between the thaw rate, so the generation of pore water pressure at the thaw front and the dissipation of pore water pressure due to drainage. So it causes a reduction in the effective stress. So if you look at the schematic, there's some top penetration, an increase in pore water, uh, excess pore water pressure, decrease in the effective stress that triggers the consolidation uh, process of the soil. And then you get settlement at the surface, even more top penetration, and then, uh, and then even more decrease in the effective stress. Uh, it, you can use, uh, so it's a moving boundary consolidation problem. So it, it's a consolidation of thawed soil, but the bottom boundary is moving as a function of the top penetration rate. And so uh, for modeling that, you need to couple the thermal and the hydromechanical components. So the rate of top penetration and the consolidation of the soil. Uh, the the easier, uh, easiest theory and most complete one to consider top consolidation is the one proposed by Morganson and Nixon. Uh, it's very simple. It has nice uh, design tools, uh, graphical design tools. So it's very easy to use, but you need to remember that this is a short a uh, uh, small strain uh, theory. So it considered that the surface is not moving a lot during time. In real permafrost degradation cases, you can have a lot of deformation, as you know. So a lot of settlement as a function of, of deformation. In such cases, it might be appropriate to uh, use a large strain uh, mo uh, model, such as the one I developed uh, with uh, Conrad. Or, or at the very least, uh, to be able to understand what is the effect of large strain on, 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 on top consolidation. And so using Morgenstern's theory, but applying factors of correction for the, those large strain effects. Thaw weakening is what happens during uh, thawing on uh, strength. So there's a reduction of the shear strength due to those excess pore water pressure. So it decreases the effective stress. It's generated uh, on thawing uh, in seasonally frozen ground or in permafrost, or thaw degrading permafrost. It causes slope and embankment stability problems, it causes decrease in uh, shear strain, bearing capacity, and the stiffness itself of the soil. Of course, it depends on the ice content, whether the thaw rate is very fast. So if it's very fast, there's more excess pore water pressure, and the soil become more unstable. And it depends on the rate of consolidation. So how quickly is the water able to escape the soil upon thawing? Uh, if you think uh, of a soil with high permeability, it might not be a problem. So uh, a brief conclusion. So for successful design uh, in engineering in cold regions, it requires a complete thermal and mechanical analysis. So you need to understand those heat exchange mechanism between the atmosphere, the infrastructure, and the ground itself. And that comes from an understanding of the heat transfer mode. If, uh, so, so you need to also consider all those significant factors in the thermal analysis. So you can do simplification, but understanding how heat uh, is transferred in those systems make, uh, makes you someone able to uh, justify those uh, simplification. And so uh, you need not to forget the effects of wind and water and snow, for example. And understanding how the, the soil behavior changes as a function of the thermal state is, is very important as well. And how those transient states of the thawing or the freezing uh, happen is, is, is uh, critical. So a few take home message before I, 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 I truly finish. The first one is, I talked a lot about some uh, many properties of the soil, so thermal properties or, or mechanical properties, but you should always remember that permafrost is a very, or soil in general, is a very heterogeneous uh, system to work with. So site investigation, so I've put the National Standard uh, of Canada uh, site investigation uh, uh, standard here, uh, is very important for 
all geotechnical engineering uh, problems, but uh, in permafrost, it's, it's a level higher because you have all those effects of, of the ice content and the variability of, of, of the soil types and the temperature. So uh, I believe uh, Dr. Doré is going to talk a little bit about that uh, in the coming weeks, but um, site investigation is very important. Also, some references you might uh, enjoy reading to enhance your understanding of coal regions engineering. The first one is the Home Order uh, Guide uh, to uh, Permafrost in Nunavut. So it's, it's a free uh, document that you can download. It, it's, uh, it's not too de detailed, but it explains all of those interactions uh, around uh, housing, a typical housing unit. So the effect of snow, uh, water, how do you take that into account in, in managing your, 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 your house? There's also uh, on the right, the guidelines for transportation infrastructure and permafrost from the Transportation Association of Canada. And other references I, I would encourage you to go and read it, it are the, all the, the standards that were developed by the CSA group and the National Standard Council Standard of Canada. Uh, those are very nicely written and, and they define most of what I talked about today including some notions of application depending on, on the guide that you're reading. So those are technical guides for design and construction, for foundations, for climate change adaptation or uh, effects of big pollution. And so uh, this is uh, my last slide. So I'll be av available for a little bit of time for question, comment and discussion. And once again, I remind you that I'm a prof, uh, assistant prof at uh, the Royal Military College. I've put my email here. Don't hesitate to reach out to me for, uh, for any opportunity. As I said, we're developing a nice uh, group of, of researchers and students working on cold regions, engineering issues and geotechnical engineering in general. And I'm always happy also to receive questions and contribute in any way I can. So uh, thank you for attending uh, this short course. And once again, thanks to Pirn for organizing all of this.